Australia's arid zone was teeming with hopping, bouncing, burrowing creatures like bilbies and quolls and bandicoots and dunnarts and betongs and numbats, animals who built elaborate nests and tunnels and left intricate tracks in the sand. They lived together very successfully and, apart from the dingo, had very few predators. One of the most enterprising of them all was a gentle, rotund creature called the stick nest rat. These rats decorated the plains of the outback with large, elaborate housing compounds made of sticks, which kept them cool in the daytime and safe from predators. Ecologist Catherine Mosby is one of a team of Australian scientists working on revolutionary research designed to accelerate natural selection to help these mid-sized native animals survive the onslaught of feral cats and foxes. And the aim is to make these gentle creatures more street smart so they can outsmart the wiliest of feral cats. Catherine Mosby is, as I speak, sitting in a courtyard outside the ABC in Adelaide with the wind blowing gently through the trees. Hello, Catherine. Hello, Richard. Now, for 12 years, you and your husband have lived on a nature reserve, a place called Secret Rocks on the Eyre Peninsula in South Australia. Tell me what it's like out there. What does the land look like? Well, it's beautiful. It's, uh, it's very quiet and peaceful. We've, we're sort of in the Mallee shrublands in the sort of southern parts of the Arizona in South Australia. So we've got a lot of Mallee, which is sort of multi-stemmed, short eucalypt species. And then we've got Triodia, which is the spinifex understory. We've got granite outcrops that sort of break out from the, from the ground and, and have rock holes in them that support frogs and things after rain. So it's very variable. We have sand dunes in some parts. We have flat, um, open woodlands in others. And, you know, these beautiful, majestic granite outcrops in others. What colour is the country? Uh, It's a lot of muted greens and sort of bluey greens. And then you've got the greys and the browns of of the rocks. But it changes through the day. So when you get the sunsets, everything turns a beautiful pink and and purple. And we get the most amazing sunsets out there that can... Uh, last a long time and cover the whole sky. I don't think I've been that far into South Australia, into the Air Peninsula, but I think I've flown over it and it looks amazing from the air. How does it look like to you? Do you recognise it when you're flying over it? Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting because it's one of the few places in South Australia in agricultural land where we have quite a lot of remnant vegetation. So nearly half the Air Peninsula is still, is still native scrub. And that compares to a lot of other areas in South Australia that are arable where sort of, you know, almost all of it's been cleared. So we're a bit further away from Adelaide, a pretty independent little place on the Air Peninsula and, yeah, great people and, and some beautiful large tracts of, of national park and, and uh, intact vegetation. Did you get bushfires raging through there in 2019 or thereabouts? We did. We lost about half our property in those bushfires, about 150 square kilometres burnt. And incredibly, our house didn't burn, but it went within about 50 50 metres of our house. So we were very, very lucky not to lose everything. But that 50 metres? <laughs> it was wow. very close. We, we were very, very lucky not to, to, not to lose everything. But uh, it's a definitely a different landscape there now. We had Previously, we were nestled in sort of a valley of really large old gum trees with hollows. And now we're in a grassland where things are regenerating. But yeah, it's going to take a long, long time to come back. Is there a boom and bust cycle there to life with rain, drought, fire? Yeah, definitely. And that's one of the things I love about the semi-arid and arid zone is it's continually changing. So you, you never know what you're going to get. If you go for a walk, you never know what you're going to see, but you also never know when you're going to get 150 millimetres of rain, which is what we got last week, or a three-year drought, which is what we've had before then. So it's certainly got its ups and downs. You say it's quiet, but how does it sound at dawn and at dusk? Yeah, when I mean quiet, I mean no sounds of traffic and people and things like that, but it's, it's <laughs> definitely uh, definitely loud at dawn and dusk with the the birds that, that we get different honey eaters that come through depending on if the rock holes are full and if the eremophilas are flowering. So And we get yeah, lots of babblers and wrens and, and yellow rump thornbills and a whole lot of different bird noises. And then at night we have all the bats that come out that sort of come under our veranda and, and try and feed on the moths that are attracted to our to our light out there. And we also get the night birds, the boobook owls and the night jars that are calling at night as well. And after rain, of course, the frogs and things as well. So yeah, it's, it's got its own soundscape, but it's, it's a, I guess, a really restful soundscape and we certainly sleep very well out there. This is, this is called arid or semi-arid and yet it sounds like you're crowded with life. Life is teeming all around you. Is that how it is? Yeah, well, I think that's a misconception about deserts is that they're sort of 
barren wastelands, but in actual fact, they've got huge diversity. And in some places, you know, over 50 species of reptile can occur in one spot and, you know, a couple of hundred species of birds and after rain, that sort of thing. And uh, certainly a lot of mammal species. But I mean, a lot of that's changed now since European settlement. We've lost a lot of those mammals that, that used to be there. How different would the land have looked 250 years ago before the arrival of Europeans? Well, there was a, a lot more understory of vegetation, so a lot of that's been grazed out by not only sheep and cattle, but over grazing by goats and rabbits and kangaroos, that sort of thing. So there would have been a lot more understory, a lot more grasses through the landscape. There certainly would have been a lot more uh, mixed ages of fires, so the Indigenous people would have had a lot more smaller burns, so there would have been a real patchwork of different age fire scars through there, so we would have had beautiful old gums with uh, hollows that would have supported possums and fascigales and, you know, those sort of animals. And then we would have had a whole lot of uh, animals on the ground, like the bilbies and the bandicoots and western quolls, stick nest rats, those sort of things. So we've lost, you know, over 60% of our mammal species in some arid areas. So, it's, yeah, it's pretty, pretty big changes. So would there have been a lot more mounds and burrows and nests on the ground as well? Yeah, absolutely. And there would have been a, a lot more soil crust as well. So when you have these hard hoofed animals that come in like sheep and cattle and goats, they break up the soil crust, which is the cryptograms that um, hold the soil together. And, and they do a great job of storing carbon and providing nutrients for, for the plants they're sort of fungi and lichen and things, things like that. So that soil crust is gone in a lot of places as well. And of course, we've had the cats and foxes that have moved in and, and really had a lot of impact on our birds and reptiles and mammals in that system. And was I exaggerating in my intro or would you have seen a lot of hippity hoppity things bouncing around the joint much more 250 years ago? Oh, yeah, definitely. The diversity and the abundance would have been a lot higher. And there would have been, as you said, nests and burrows and, um, you know, stick nests and, and all sorts of things dotted ac across the landscape. So, and, you know, when you read some of the explorers' uh, journals and things, they describe some of these things. But certainly, yeah, a lot more diversity and abundance there than there is now. Why are tree hollows so utterly, utterly precious in this environment? Well, things like bats use them, birds use them for nesting, and a, a, a wide range of other mammals like fascigales and possums and things use them. Even um, snakes, carpet pythons use tree hollows. They're just a really important refuge, and a lot of the soil is too hard to dig burrows in, so they need to take refuge from temperature extremes and from predators in other, in other forms. So where you have the sand dunes and you have a lot of burrowing animals still in the system, those burrows were used by lots of other species as well. But outside of those areas where you don't have sand dunes, those, those tree hollows are really important. When you live out there, do you get a different sense of seeing or a different sense of time after you're there for a while? I think you look forward to seeing the changes. So, you know, when the rainbow bearders arrive in about October, it's always like, who's going to hear the first rainbow bearder that turns up? So you just get used to... The cycle, I guess, not, not, not so much with the seasons of summer, winter, etc., but the, the rainfall seasons as well. And everything's interesting. So even in the drought, when you walk around, you'll see which species are hanging in and which ones have, have, have died out or moved on. And, and after the rain, when you see the frogs are mating and we've got tadpoles in the rock holes and then they dry up and, and things have to move on and it's just ever-changing. So I think you just... You just Every time you go for a walk out there, something different's happening. You've got Dunnarts living there with you on the property. Uh, are these creatures, are they what we normally call marsupial mice? Yeah, so we've got quite a few threatened um, species on our property. One of them is the mallyfowl, which is a, a pretty amazing bird that you know, builds these huge mounds to incubate its eggs. But we've also got the Sandhill Dunnart, which is a nationally threatened. And it's, it's a carnivorous marsupial. It's got a pouch. It lives in the big triodia tussocks. So these are the spiky spinifex grass that grows across lots of uh, inland Australia. And um, it's probably one of the reasons that, that species manage to hang on because those, those areas are really not very suitable for, for um, sheep and cattle grazing. They're really not a very palatable grass, at least when they're when it's an adult. So those areas sort of didn't get cleared and um, those areas support really high diversity of reptiles but also these amazing sandhill dunnarts. And speaking scientifically, on a scale of 1 to 10 of adorableness, where would you place these dunnarts, Catherine? Oh, they're, they're pretty up there. They've got these sort of uh, beautiful big eyes and they've got this 
this, uh, like almost like an eye ring, almost like eyeliner around their eye and black sort of stiff crest of hairs underneath their tail. So they're very distinctive. You can't really mix them up with anything else. And they're, they're almost like they're, their skin's a bit too big for their body. So they're quite sort of, um, what's the word for it? Um, a little wrinkled. <laughs> a little bit wrinkled and, and very fluffy. Wrinkled and fluffy. <laughs> sometimes, we don't, sometimes we don't see them at all. So we'll, we do trapping for them every year. And some years we catch none and other years we might catch 20. So it depends on how much rain we've had and when the rain's fallen. But yeah, they can be very cryptic and very hard to pick up. You said they're carnivorous. What do they eat? Pretty well anything they can fit into their mouth. So they would eat spiders, small reptiles. They'd eat a lot of invertebrates and a lot of beetles and, and those sort of things. So anything they can sort of find. So they come out at night. They're nocturnal during the day. They burrow down beneath these spinifex hummocks and they come out at night and, and they're very, in fact, all dasurids are, are really great hunters. So they really alert and very agile and they scurry around in amongst the leaf litter and climb around over dead logs and, and just searching for prey. And they're pretty efficient little killers. Well, how much can they eat in a single night? Oh, <laughs> as much as they can as they can fit into their stomach, I guess. Um, they're, you know, they, they, they do sort of have good seasons and bad seasons so they they tend to breed over the spring sort of october november december and if we haven't had good winter rains then the breeding is not is not very uh, successful that year and we don't, we have very low numbers and then if we've had good winter rains you know we get we get large numbers of them running around the place and they can travel really long distances like several kilometers in a night and they're only a small animal sort of 30 40 grams so that's a long way for a, for a small animal to go but a lot of desert animals can actually travel very long distances like several kilometers in a night or can disperse over much further distances than that i read that they don't drink water why don't they drink water where do they get moisture from well most arid animals don't don't need free water they can get water from their food i mean if there's dew on the rocks and things a lot of animals will also you know lick dew off the leaves and off the off the rocks and things like that but in general most arid species don't don't need free water and that's uh, one of the reasons why things like feral cats are such a uh, a good animal in the arid zone in terms of being able to survive and adapt and, and cause so much damage there as well. Are you saying that they get their water from spiders and crickets by and large? They're, they're living on spider water by and large. <laughs> Something like that. <laughs> That's right. And even the rodents are the same. Uh, Spinifex hopping mice and things get all their water from, from their food, seeds and, and green, green vegetation. Catherine, I want you to tell me about a a particular type of bandicoot, the shark bay bandicoot, that you've been reintroducing to the mainland. Tell me about what kind of a creature this, this bandicoot is. Well, it's the smallest bandicoot in Australia, so it can, it can fit on your hand. It's only a couple of hundred grams. And it used to occur uh, right across the sort of southern part of Australia. There was a lot of different bandicoot species that were related to the shark bay bandicoot. There was most of those, well, all of those are now extinct except for the shark bay bandicoot. So the populations declined of the bandicoot complex by, you know, over 99%. And it's really only found on two offshore islands in Western Australia, um, Bernier and Dory Island. And luckily that uh, those islands were free of cats and foxes and, and uh, European intervention and they, they managed to remain on those two islands. Have they got the long snout that bandicoots have? They do, yep. So they, they don't live in a burrow. They live just under the leaf litter. They build a little nest, a little, like a scrape out, a little scrape under the leaf litter and um, they cover that with leaves and they just sit there during the day. So they're, they're quite hard to see. So when you radio track them, it's quite difficult to see where their nests are. They're very well hidden. And then they come out at night and they dig lots of little foraging pits in the sand. They're digging up spiders or they're digging up scorpions or they're digging up beetles or digging up seeds. Um, they eat ant larvae and termites as well. So pretty much, again, very omnivorous in that they'll eat pretty much anything and um, very quiet little creatures, very cryptic and hard to see at night if you're walking around and they tend to freeze if they get startled and, and they use that sort of camouflage to try and prevent themselves from being seen by predators. When they do move, they jump. Tell me how they jump. If they get startled, they can do this vertical leaping where they just sort of jump up in the air, you know, up to a metre in the air and and then scurry off under a bush. And it can be quite disconcerting if you're out there trying to catch them or radio track them when they do that. So they're, I, I sort of think of them as being quite highly strung amongst the bandicoot family. They're prone to uh, vertical leaping. <laughs> so you're dealing with these levitating bandicoots that appear in the desert in the middle of the night. 
When you're dealing with the feral predators that have brought these animals so close to extinction, what are the worst of them that you're dealing with out there? Well, it would be it would definitely be the the fox and the feral cat. They're the two the two big ones in the arid zone. But you know, in saying that, they are sustained in many parts of Australia by the European rabbit, which is also introduced. So, where they tend to uh, wreak the most havoc is in areas where there's rabbits around as well that can sustain those high densities of cats and foxes, which means they can then prey on our native species as well. How much of a problem does Australia have at large with feral cats like that? Oh, yeah. Huge problem. So a couple of reasons. One, we've got between two and six million feral cats in Australia. So that's a lot of feral cats. So these are cats that, that they're not relying on humans at all. So they're not being fed. They're not stray cats. They're just living in the wild, in the bush. And that number varies depending on rainfall. They can build up after, after rain and, and then crash during droughts as well. Um, and they don't require water, so they're found in pretty much every habitat type. About 99, over 99% of Australia has got feral cats in it, so they're just everywhere. They can breed very fast and they can breed continuously if conditions are good. And they're just amazing hunters. They're sort of a stalk and pounce hunter. And so they can just creep up and then, you know, pounce very quickly onto native animals and they sort of grab them around the neck and... and and kill them that way. So they're just really efficient hunters and a lot of our native species haven't, haven't evolved with that type of hunting style. Are they harder to deal with than foxes? Are they more formidable than foxes? Foxes are also a massive threat, but they can be controlled to some extent through aerial baiting and, and that's something that's, at least in the internal deserts in the western parts of Australia, is, is used quite a lot to control Foxes. So that's 1080, which is it's it's a mimics a sort of a, a fluoroacetate compound that's found in native plants. And those native plants, like gastrolobiums, they're found in Western Australia and Central Australia, not so much in Eastern Australia. And so our native animals have developed a, a tolerance to this to this, this compound. So they don't get affected so much by the by the 1080. But anything introduced to Australia, like rabbits or cats or foxes, are very susceptible to 1080. So in the western parts of Australia and the and the central parts of Australia, you can use 1080 without having too much impact on the native animals. It's a bit different in the eastern states where the resistance is, you know, not as high. So that's um, used really effectively in South Australia and Western Australia to bait foxes aerially. And so you can you can do some pretty good broad scale control with foxes but cats are a lot different they don't like to take baits they like to hunt their prey they like live prey so they're a lot more difficult to control are they warier animals than foxes they are very neophobic so that's what we call an animal that's (laughs) neophobic scared of of new things as a few friends of mine are also neophobic (laughs) but um Definitely cats are are one of those animals that's neophobic, so they're quite wary. And so, you know, even if there is a a bait on the ground, often they won't approach it or they'll just look at it and sniff it and walk away. So there's been lots of research in Western Australia done to try and find a bait that is palatable to feral cats. And and to some extent that's been developed, but it's still very much dependent on how much live prey is around. So if there's lots of alternative prey, cats are not, not hungry, they won't take the baits as regularly as foxes will. So it's certainly harder to control over broader areas. Catherine, I'm assuming they're not big enough to take down like a a kangaroo or a wallaby or a dingo for that matter. But what animals can they take down, these cats? They can take down anything up to their own body weight. So they certainly can take wallabies down, young small wallabies like uh, black flank rock wallabies and juvenile, you know, other smaller wallabies and things like that but they certainly take bilbies bandicoots rodents you know anything we, we sort of talk about this critical weight range in australia which is anything that's sort of 35 grams to five and a half kilograms and that's sort of the weight range of mammals that have been most affected since european settlement and that that's really the prey size range for foxes and cats sort of combined so anything in that weight range is pretty much missing from particularly from arid areas which have been hit very hard with extinctions of mammals and so, yeah, they're, they're pretty wide-ranging and large cats take larger prey, so those big males can get to six kilograms and they can take animals, you know, up to five kilos. So until recently, how close have these feral cats brought people like you, ecologists, who want to preserve native animals, to despair, to the point of despair? Yeah, it's been, it's been a long battle with the feral cat in arid areas as well. There's been a history of of failed reintroductions where people have tried to reintroduce animals back into the arid zone, bilbies and, and betongs and, and bandicoots and things like that. And 
generally, and they've always failed through um, predation from cats and foxes. So that's been, and particularly cats, because often they'll be baiting for foxes and, and so the fox numbers will be low, but the feral cats are still still there in the environment. So that's really caused, I guess, a big recent increase in the number of fenced sanctuaries that we have in Australia. So we now have more than 30 of these across Australia and these are these are fences that we, we fence the cats and foxes out. So they're sort of you know 1.8 metre high mesh fences with overhangs and various electric wires on them designed to, to keep cats and foxes out. And that's, that's really where we've seen the most success with our reintroduction. So this is something you've been doing as part of an organisation called Arid Recovery. Once you've set up these feral proof fences and reintroduced native species into them, how do they interact with each other? Do they prey on each other then once you've done that? Yeah, they do. It's it's actually fascinating to sort of try and get a bit of a glimpse into what the ecosystem would have looked like before Europeans. So you can walk around inside these sanctuaries and you can, particularly arid recovery where there's a lot of sand, you can read the sand and you can see what animals are doing and how they're interacting with each other and you can see them. Um, We've we've just released western quolls into arid recovery a few years ago and they definitely prey on the bandicoots and some of the bedongs and keep the numbers down. And you can just see all the foraging pits that they dig and then all the leaf litter that falls into the foraging pits and the little seedlings that germinate there because they're, they're great little microsites of, of for germination. And uh, you just see how the land changes when you add these species back. You were saying there before that some of these animals can you know, cross two kilometres in a night and they're able to scurry really quickly. They're so well adapted to the landscape. Why then do they fall prey to predators like cats? What makes them so vulnerable to a creature like a cat? Why can't they get away more quickly and uh, speedily from predators like feral cats? So they didn't co-evolve with cats and foxes. So they, they I guess, don't have those sort of, they're not, prepared for the hunting styles of the cats and foxes. So cats and foxes as well, they both sort of stalk prey and pounce on them. So unless the prey sees the the predator first and can react really quickly if it, if it starts its pounce, then it will get killed by the cats and foxes. And cats are very, very smart predators. So they learn where the prey live in the environment. They learn where the where the burrows are and where the dings are, areas are that they go to, and they'll sit and wait for them. They can recognise burrows? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. And foxes as well. They'll, you see foxes at Malifau Mounds that will just patrol Malifau Mounds waiting for young Malifau to hatch. So they're very smart. They know where these, these prey are living in their, in their environment and in their home range and they'll, they'll hone in on them. And particularly once they learn to hunt a, a species, they can just hyperpredate on that species until they've pretty much wiped out that population in the area and then they'll move on somewhere else. So they're, they're just really efficient hunters, very smart hunters. And that hunting style of stalking and pouncing, I guess, doesn't give our native species much chance to, to get away. So some things um, that do help, so they're not as good. Cats certainly don't hunt as, as well in, in areas with thick cover. So where you have thick vegetation and understory, cats find it difficult to sort of stalk and hunt things. So they like sort of open habitats with, you know, small patches of cover within them. And so what we've done in a lot of our desert areas is brought in these rabbits and sheep and and cattle and they've really opened up that understory and that's made it a lot easier for for cats to hunt in those environments. Nonetheless, you have this underlying problem of what you call native animal naivety when it comes to these predators. Is it it not unlike the dodo? You know, when Europeans arrived, I think it was Mauritius, where the dodo was, was indigenous, the dodo had never seen anything like it, would walk up and make itself easy prey for the predator, which was the human in this, in this case. Uh, is it a bit like that? They just haven't evolved alongside these creatures, therefore they don't properly recognise the threat that these predators pose for them. Yeah, so there's a few different things there. So, so what we call island, island syndrome is what you've sort of described there, where an animal is isolated from predators for a certain amount of time. It starts to lose those anti-predator behaviours because they're quite costly. If you're, if you're really worried about predators and you're sort of scurrying around undercover and you're not, you're not taking those risks out in the open to get the good food, um, you know, that, that sort of stuff gets uh, selected out pretty quickly when you haven't got predators around because it's just a, it's a wasted behaviour. So when you have animals on islands without predators, they do lose those anti-predators 
behaviours quite quickly. Oh, and the energy goes into offspring then in that case, <laughs> instead. That's right, and fighting over the food and, and those other things that, that they need to survive on islands. So, you know, those behaviours get lost and then, and then sometimes they can be regained quite quickly if they haven't been lost for too long. But in the case of, of species that haven't co-evolved together, they've got to evolve a whole new a whole new set of behaviours to, to offset that predator. And normally predators and prey sort of co-evolve together and it's like an arms race. The predator evolves better predation methods and then the prey evolves at the same time, better methods of avoiding that predator and, it, and it, they sort of go hand in hand. But when you have got this sort of evolutionary mismatch between predators and prey, then the prey are at a, at a big disadvantage. This is Conversations with Richard Feidler. Hear more conversations anytime on the ABC Listen app or go to abc.net.au slash conversations. You were talking there about the project you have, which was to build these very, very large 120 square metre, kilometre, I should say, a fenced predator-proof reserves where you've reintroduced some of these these beautiful hopping marsupials and animals. In the long run, though, does excluding cats and foxes from their lives, does it make it worse in the long run? Because you're not really teaching them anything. They're not really learning to avoid the animals, are they? That's right. They're really a insurance population, I guess. They're there to sort of as a stopgap to stop these animals going extinct and to reduce the risk of that extinction by you know, spreading the risk across Australia in these small pockets of fence reserves. But the the long term aim is to get them outside fence reserves because I mean when you have animals in a small area, you get genetic inbreeding, you're stopping them from naturally being able to disperse and, and do a lot of that movement across the arid zone, which they generally would do. They follow the rains or they have droughts and boom and bust and that sort of thing, which you, you can't really have those things operating in a small area. And also, yeah, you're not you're not improving their anti predator responses. So, some, sometimes we we've been releasing native predators to try and sort of keep those anti predator behaviours in those animals or try and get those behaviours back. But eventually, they're going to have to deal with cats and foxes when they get outside the fences. So that's that's really the the long term aim. I'm just wondering how bad things are though. We we've reached the point of crisis with the survival of these creatures that we have to really think hard about how they're going to live alongside feral cats, given that we can't, with the technology we have at the moment, think of thoroughly eradicating these feral cats. Is this a, a realisation you've arrived at and is this where you've proceeded from, this realisation, in your research, Catherine? Yeah, well, I guess we did a lot of releases outside of our fence reserves at Arrow Recovery and we found that uh, they were all being killed by feral cats despite all our aerial baiting and fox control and cat control. All you're doing is feeding the feral cats, in other words, if you do Yeah, it was, it was really depressing just to see, you know, I mean, sometimes they'd last six months or 12 months, but, you know, they'd always end up um, with the population becoming extinct. So I guess we started, we started initially looking at ways to improve our predator control, so we sort of we took that angle to start with. So my husband, John Reed, sort of invented a Felix a grooming trap, which is based on some of the work we did up there at Arid Recovery. And we're looking at population protecting implants, which are sort of implants of 1080 that you put into native prey. So when the cat eats them, it dissolves in the stomach. So we, we're sort of still pursuing kind of innovative feral cat control solutions. But I guess we also started looking at it from a prey perspective and saying, well, what can we do from the other side of the of the coin in terms of improving these prey responses like can we can we also get these prey to to just be able to coexist with cats even if we can't control the cats themselves and this meant essentially putting your foot on the accelerator of natural selection in some ways tell me how this thought evolved with you and when where, where it's led you to yeah so i guess we sort of came from the perspective that you know, every population of animals should be able to deal with a certain density of predators. Like one, if you had sort of 10,000 bilbies and one cat, and that's not going to cause population extinction. So it's about um, if we can get low densities of cats into the environment for long enough, can we actually sort of accelerate this natural selection and eventually have a population of animals that can 
can coexist with cats. It almost sounds like a vaccination system, like you introduce a few of the, the bacillus, if you like, and that gets the immune system up and running. Yeah, that's right. And I think the, the main thing is not to overcook it and have too many cats in there and the population goes extinct and not to have too few in there, in which case, you know, they're not really interacting with the cats and, and learning to avoid them. So trying to get that that level right, and it's very difficult to do that at a, at a broad scale. So we, we decided to to fence off one area of arid recovery, which is about 26 square kilometres, so it's a really big paddock, and use that as a sort of an experimental paddock to see if we can, if we can test these ideas and see if we can, we can get this sort of co-evolution and accelerated natural selection happening, or even just learning, because, um, you know, there's different ways that, that, that animals can learn to coexist with things. So we, we, we started off with a population of, of bilbies and burrowing badongs in there. We, we just added one or two cats to start with and we just watched and, and we, we measured and we, we looked at these animals and we compared them to a, a control group that, that didn't have cats and foxes in them. And um, we, we kept that going for several years and we kept adding a few more cats when the population was, was stable and removing a few cats when the population started to decline. And yeah, and we started to see some pretty, pretty incredible changes um, over just a short period. Like what? Like how? How, how did they change? So for the burrowing bedongs, um, we do something called flight initiation distance, which is how close we can get to them before they flee. And we found within only 18 months of living with the cats, they were much, much harder to approach. So whereas the ones in the rest of the reserve where there's no cats, sometimes you could walk almost right up to a betong and, um, and almost touch it. But in these areas with the cats, sometimes we couldn't get within sort of 30 or 40 metres of them before they'd flee. So they were certainly becoming more wary um, and more vigilant. So we'd look at feed trays and how they behaved at feed trays and, uh, you know, and we'd also looked at physical measurements as well. So with the bedongs, their hind feet started to get bigger. So the animals inside that area started to get bigger. And we put that down to things like, you know, bigger animals are harder to catch. Maybe they can escape quicker. Wow. And they're harder to eat as well because obviously bigger bedongs are sort of on that prey size range, about one and a half kilos, a big bedong. So, you know, it only has to get a little bit bigger to be harder for a cat to catch. And even escape behaviour, so better reactivity. So when you let an animal go, it just it just bounces off quicker. It takes off um, earlier than, than ones that aren't in with cats. So definitely seeing these differences in the populations after only sort of, you know, a couple of years. So correct me if I'm wrong here, it sounds like you're saying that, first of all, you introduce a stimulus to change behaviour amongst a generation of these bilbies and betongs so that they move away more quickly. They're, they're learning to do that. And then they're passing that learned behaviour down to their offspring very quickly? Well, that's the, that's the key. So there's one thing with animals learning um, individually, but whether or not that's heritable is, um, is the key because that's how selection occurs. It has to be passed on to the next generation. So um, one of the experiments we did is a common garden experiment where we took betongs from the cat experiment pen and we took control betongs that hadn't been exposed to cats and we put them into a smaller paddock and we, we measured their offspring and we found that those offspring retained that, um, that increased hind foot length. Um, so that, that suggests that it is, it is selection and that it is heritable traits. So that's, that's pretty exciting. So behavioural change is mixing with physiological change of these animals then. The ones with bigger feet that can run faster and move more quickly are more likely to survive and get away and they're the ones who are going on to have babies. But I would have thought this process would take like 100 years to happen. How are you able to make it work so quickly? Well, there's lots of examples of natural selection occurring quite quickly in the wild, particularly when you've got like a really strong selective pressure. And predation is one of the strongest selective pressures you can imagine. Um, so, you know, there's work being done uh, with cane toe sausages and northern quolls showing that, um, that they can teach northern quolls not to eat cane toed sausages and then they pass that on to their offspring um, in the next generation. So things can happen pretty quickly when it's, uh, when it's a life or death situation there. I mean, and these, some, I mean, just because we can see changes doesn't mean they're significant enough to have a, a huge difference right now. It might take 100 years for those changes to be significant. So we did an experiment where we released betongs from that cat exposed paddock and from the control paddock into an, into an area outside the reserve. And, you know, there was no difference in survival at that stage. So even though we're seeing these sort of, physio these sort of physical and behavioural differences, they're not yet 
be strong enough in betongs to, to confer a survival advantage. That doesn't mean they won't eventually, but it's, it might be too early. We did the same thing with bilbies, however, and we did get a survival advantage with ones that had been with cats. So um, that's interesting that there's differences between species and, and, and this sort of technique might work better in some species than others. Is it difficult to grapple with the fact that the animals are being changed? Is, I mean, is there some disquiet about that? And, and to do it so quickly, given that ecosystems are often, such as they are, often delicate mechanisms. Is there some disquiet about introducing radical changes to the physiology of these animals uh, in, in a short period of time? Well, I think it's a bit different to actually changing the genome, which is sort of what, what CRISPR is all about and that sort of genetic alteration with, in America with the American chestnut where they're putting a gene in there to confer resistance to that blight that has affected the American chestnut. So the transgenic chestnuts that they're looking to reintroduce back into the wild. And there's certainly some disquiet um, amongst you know people and members of the public with, with that kind of gene altering. I guess what we're trying to do is is something that would occur naturally, but we're just trying to speed it up in a, in a sort of a, a natural way. It's a bit like crossbreeding, you know, that people do for, have been doing for thousands of years and selective breeding dogs and all that sort of stuff. So it's, yes, it's sort of altering genomes, but it's doing it in, in a way that I guess is, is just accelerating a natural process. And maybe we just don't have time to to no. be too worried about that sort of mm. thing. I mean, we could sit back and do nothing and let all our native animals go extinct um, or we can try new things. And I'm not saying this is going to be a silver bullet, but I think we need to be bold and we need to, we need to try a whole range of things if we want these threatened species to be back out in the wild. So in five years, you're seeing, as you say, these betongs with much larger hind feet that look sort of more kangaroo-like now. Uh, and while you're not getting great results on their survival rates in the wild. Yep, you are getting that for the bilby. Is that thrilling to suddenly have introduced a more robust bilby into the world, Catherine? Um, I think there's still a long way to go. I'm always a bit um, apprehensive about, you know, we've changed the world, or whatever. I think there's a, there's a long way to go with this method. And I don't know. It's still pretty cool, Catherine. It's still pretty cool. It's pretty exciting. But I, I think there's other things we could be doing right now to save these threatened species that don't require all this research as well, like, you know, improving our vegetation condition and, um, you know, the rabbit calisi virus or rabbit, rabbit hemorrhagic disease that was released is, is one of the, the best things that ever happened in arid Australia. So, and that was a biocontrol that was, you know, it was probably pushed from an agricultural point of view, but it had a, had a huge impact in arid Australia where we saw threatened species increase their distribution by 70 times just from releasing you know, a biocontrol agent. So things like that, I think, are probably going to have, you know, a much bigger effect and we should, be, we should be investing in those kind of things as well. Catherine, I need to talk to you about the stick nest rat that's in your part of the world, this absolutely beautiful marsupial, the stick nest rat that I mentioned in the introduction. Can you describe what they look like? How big are they? Yeah, well, they're actually a rodent. They're not a, they're not a marsupial at all. They're one of Australia's oh, really? native rodents. So we do have a lot of native rodents in Australia. Most of them are quite small, so a lot of pseudomies um, rodents that we get throughout the arid zone. And in some places, that's all, almost all the mammals we've got left because they're too small. They're sort of smaller than that critical weight range I was talking about before. But the stick nest rat is a Leporillus condator, and it, it used to occur... Um, well, there was a lesser and a greater stick nest rat, but the lesser stick nest rat's now extinct. But both of them occurred sort of up until up towards Alice Springs, basically south of Alice Springs, through the Kinapod shrub lands. And they went extinct, well, the lesser stick nest rat went extinct, and the greater stick nest rat went extinct on the mainland in about the 1930s and was only found on one offshore island, the Franklin Islands. It's two islands that are connected but sort of managed as one in South Australia, and that was the only place in the whole of Australia that the stick nest rats were left. Are they placid animals? They're beautiful animals. They've got really large... They look a little bit like a, a small rabbit. They've got quite large ears, very placid, um, very industrious. So they spend a lot of time building their nests, which can be you know, up to a metre and a half high and two metres across, and they sort of can you know, have sticks up to the size of your thumb, width of your thumb, that they, they weave into this, this intricate mass of, of, of sticks that you can't pull apart. So you, the whole thing is actually glued together with a combination of their urine and, and feces and, um, and also other plant material. And it's just a really solid structure and they're 
we've tried to take them apart before old ones to look at them and they're yeah, really difficult. <laughs> and, uh, you know, back before European settlement, the indigenous people used to burn the nest to get the occupants because apparently they were quite good eating. And a lot of the early explorers used to burn the nest as well to see what was inside them. So that's one thing that they, they can't survive is the fire. Um, but, yeah, they were dotted around the landscape, these nests. So they also had them in um, uh, rocky hills and overhangs and things like that. They would build nests in there. And there's some nests still out there that you can see that would be you know, nearly 100 years old now. And some of them, they have quite a few nests close together so they can build runways between their nests. And so if you go out during the day, you can see these little runways through the grass that goes between all the nests and connects the nests together. Um, and each nest has usually just got sort of a female in there and, and the males will travel between nests. So one male will mate with several females and the female raises young in that nest and those, those young will take over the nest when she dies. So they sort of hand the nest on to, to subsequent generations. So they're amazing. You're telling me that these, that like little beavers essentially, who are building cities made out of their own cement. Yeah. It is, it is. They're incredible animals. And um, they were only found on this Franklin Islands. That was all that was left. And, and some work by um, some of the South Australian National Parks people in the 80s, um, Pete Copley and Tony Robinson, they did a lot of work on stick nest rats and reintroduced them to a few other islands so that the population was secured. So Reevesby Island, St. Peter's Island, and then sent some over to Western Australia to Salutation Island. But the rats that we released at um, Arid Recovery, that was the the first time they'd been released back into the arid zone. And um, yeah, it was it was pretty incredible to see them building their nests again after, you know, over a hundred or nearly a hundred years of extinction. Why do they build the nests? Well, they, they use them as protection from predators. So they're quite susceptible to things like snakes and goannas and western quolls and things like that. So they, they build nests as protection from predators, but also from temperature extremes. They have, often have a burrow underneath the nest that they can pop down into if things get hot. But in summer, they'll often leave the nest and, um, and, and go into a, a betong warren or a bilby warren where there's more thermal um, uh, insulation. So they, they, they breed above ground in the nests and then often in summer, they'll, they'll leave the nest for the hot weather and, and go underground. And who builds the nest? Is it the male or female? Well, both of them will help. So I've seen before where um, male rats will bring flowers and things to the female who's busy at the nest upgrading it and she'll pick up the flower and look at it and if she doesn't like the look of it, she'll just throw it away and if she likes it, she'll go and put it on top of her nest. So No way. You're kidding me. That's really... <laughs> They're quite fussy with their nests and you often see little, when they're just about to start breeding, if you, if you go to the nest, you'll see little fresh bits of vegetation in there, flowers or leaves or, you know, that sort of thing. Um, and they've got little grassy lined um, nest chambers inside the nest that, that with dry grass. So they're, they're very quite intricate, um, you know, nests, which is probably why they pass them on. They've, they spend a lot of time to build them, so you don't want to just uh, waste that, so you pass that on to your offspring. Really? And, and are they like beavers? Do they try like gnaw away at branches in order to get them in the sticks to the right size? Yeah, they'll definitely chew branches down and, or they'll select sticks of the right size and, and drag them across. And um, they usually try and build their nest inside a bush or under an overhang or against a tree or something that gives it a bit of structure and they'll sort of weave it around that that structure and, and that gives it a bit of strength as well. I'm looking at a photo of a stick nest rat standing on its hindquarters um, and it appears to be holding a flower while it looks straight at the camera. Look, I don't know, you've got to be putting that on all your publicity, I reckon, because it's one of the most lovely things in the world. How common were they before the arrival of, of Europeans and introduced species, these stick nest rats on, the rats on the mainland? Yeah, well, they, they were in a band all the way from Western Australia, from the coast all the way through South Australia, into New South Wales. Um, they did go south of the Murray in Victoria as well. So they were really common um, and their nests were quite easy to see. So they were often recorded by sort of early naturalists and, and explorers as well because they were quite visible in the landscape. Um, but then as the sheep and cattle came through, um, because one of the things about the stick nest rats is it's it's – it eats a lot of succulent vegetation. So it needs really sort of high quality to get its water content and everything from its vegetation. It, it needs to eat quite high quality um, plants. And those are the same sort of plants that sheep and cattle like to eat as well. So as the sheep and cattle move through the arid zone and were brought in, they would eat out the, the succulent 
um, vegetation and the salt bush, and then the rats would start to decline. And then, of course, after that, you had the cats and foxes that moved through and finished them off as well. So um, gradually the, the nests that were out in the open would sort of fall apart. So the ones under the overhangs and in caves, they, they've lasted a lot longer because they're out, um, out of the elements. But those sort of ones on the plains, they, they're all gone now. You don't see any signs of those anymore. But, yeah, it sort of uh, happened fairly quickly. And by the 1930s, they were, they were all gone. All gone from the mainland, but there were these outposts on these little islands. So how have you been working to bring them back into the mainland? So we did a trial of them back in the late 1990s up at Arrow Recovery. We started off with just 10 to sort of see how they would go because they, no one had put them back in the arid zone before and we didn't know how they would go. And uh, they did really well. They bred and they built nests and they, they settled in and they, they managed to survive their first summer. So we did a, another release in, in 1999 of about 100 rats. And they, they did really well for the first 10 years up at Arid Recovery. They, they boomed and we had, we had lots of rats running around everywhere. And then the last 10 years they have started to decline up there and there's, there's a few reasons for that. One is our burrowing bedong numbers reached really high levels. We ended up with 6,000 burrowing bedongs up at Arid Recovery. And unfortunately, when you put a kangaroo or a macropod inside a fenced area, they, they breed up to really high numbers. So they sort of ate out a lot of the high quality food, just the way that um, sheep and cattle do. And that caused a bit of a decline. We also think um, that the goanna numbers increased in there. So when you get rid of cats and foxes, you, you trigger a whole lot of sort of trophic cascades where the next predator in line, which in our case was the goanna, increased in abundance. And then everything that the goanna eats starts to decline. So we started to see a decline in geckos which go in as eat, and also they started feeding on the stick nest rats as well. So it's quite a complicated system, and we also started to see really hot summers. So the heat wave duration and, and incidence in the arid zone is really increasing, and over the last 50 years has increased by an incredible amount. I think there's now something like 30 more days in Alice Springs over 40 than there was you know, 20 or 30 years ago. So we're seeing these really extreme summers, and even though stick nest rats some of them can go down burrows. They're still quite susceptible to heat. And so we're seeing quite a lot of summer die off of the population. So, yeah, they're not doing too great at the moment. But it's, I guess we've learnt a fair bit about stick nest rats and, and where the best habitat is for them. And I think if we do do, do another reintroduction up there, we'll, we'll choose slightly different habitat and, and better habitat for them. You know, quite famously, after wolves were reintroduced to Yosemite National Park in the United States, all kinds of unexpected improvements occurred in the habitat. No one had really seen this coming. Like there'd been, turns out there'd been way too many deer that were trampling the landscape. So the introduction of wolves meant that deer population declined quite rapidly. That helped the beavers for some reason. And all these other species that had been struggling suddenly came surging back. Is it too early to say, but has the reintroduction of these native animals to the arid zone, has that seen improvements in other areas you haven't foreseen yet? Or is, this, or is it too early to say that, Catherine? We've definitely seen yeah, trophic cascades and things happening at Arid Recovery and some of the other fence reserves as well. Yeah, it just triggers a whole cascading effect on different levels in the ecosystem. So even just bilbies are voracious diggers and so they dig foraging pits all over the landscape. So you walk around out there at Arid Recovery and you just see holes in the sand everywhere. And those holes, they trap nitrogen and carbon and leaf litter and, and they just become these little micro sites for, for seedling germination. So you get better water infiltration. So they've changed the whole way that that leaf litter is distributed through the landscape and that seedlings are distributed through the landscape. So that's, you know, at a very small scale. And then you've got, obviously, some things go down, some things go up. So we've got little um, little lizards called Laristas, but they're, they're eaten by bilbies. And so the Larista numbers down, have gone down inside the reserve compared to outside. So inside and outside the reserve is like two different um, ecosystems uh, functioning in really different ways. Outside, you've got lots of rabbits. So the vegetation is very different to inside. And you've got cats and foxes. So you've got a lot less. Well, you don't have any of these... Um, reintroduced mammals that we've got inside and so inside is really different we've got different plants germinating and different plants doing well in there compared to outside so yeah it, it changes the whole ecosystem when you add 
add back these these mammals. There's maybe another benefit further down the track if you're accelerating the process of natural selection from these with these native species and makes it which make it uh, easier for them to escape predatory feral cats and foxes. Well, then it becomes harder for those introduced species to find food to eat. And maybe their numbers decline as a result of that as well. I wonder, is that, or is that too optimistic, Catherine? <laughs> I think it's early days with all, this, all these types of questions, but I think the, the most important thing is that we've got to keep learning and we've got to keep measuring and monitoring and doing this research because um, that's the only way we're going to be able to reverse these declines in the long term is, is people just trying new things and, and doing experiments. Catherine, it's been great to speak with you and congratulations on all the work you're doing on conserving the existence of these, these absolutely beautiful, beautiful native animals. Thank you so much. Thanks, Richard. Catherine Mose is the co-founder of Arid Recovery, an independent not-for-profit that's running a 123-square-kilometre wildlife reserve in South Australia's Air Peninsula to help threatened native species survive and thrive across the Australian outback. They have a website aridrecovery.org.au I'm Richard Feidler. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to listen to more free podcasts or download the ABC Listen app and stream ad-free.